Um, well, welcome. My name is Pastor Justin. I'm the, the senior pastor here at New Life, and we are in a series, it's like our eighth week, I believe, of On Mission. And this is essentially, those two words are two words that I feel like are prophetic statement for us as a church family as we move forward into 2023. And we've been asking the question, like, what, what does it look like for a local church to live on mission together. And uh, we said that it, you know, it requires love and compassion and intentionality. It requires us not just to be hearers of the word, but also doers of the word. And um, like living on mission simply, this is what we're going to talk about today, simply is this realization that we have a great invitation to be a part of this ministry with him. The great co-mission that we get to cooperate with the mission that God has for each and every single one, for the church, that, uh, that we have a role to play, uh, no matter how small that role may look like. And so we're going to read a really well-known scripture today and take a look at it. Uh, it's the feeding of the 5,000. And so if you would turn to Matthew chapter 14 and stand with me as we honor the reading of God's Word, I'd really appreciate it. This is one of my most favorite miracle stories of Jesus. Uh, mostly because I literally cannot fathom how it happened. Um, Matthew 14, let's read it together. Allow it to just kind of soak in. Verse 13, when Jesus heard what had happened, he withdrew by boat privately to a solitary place. Hearing of this, the crowds followed him on foot from the towns. And when Jesus landed and saw a large crowd, he had compassion on them and healed their sick. As evening approached, the disciples came to him and said, this is a remote place, and it's getting, already getting late. Send the crowds away so that they can go to the villages and buy themselves some food. And Jesus replied, they don't need to go away. You give them something to eat. We have here only five loaves of bread and two fish, they answered. Well, bring them here to me, he said. And he directed the people to sit down on the grass, taking the five loaves and the two fish, and looking up to heaven, he gave thanks and broke the loaves. Then he gave them to the disciples, and the disciples gave them to the people. They all ate and were satisfied, and the disciples picked up 12 basketfuls of broken pieces that were left over. The number of those who ate was about 5,000 men besides women and children. Lord, I thank you for your word. Um, I, love, I love the miraculous power. Uh, I love the outlandish, the preposterous, the faith-filled reality of walking on mission with you. I love that you take the small that we have and multiply it and make it so much bigger, so much greater, so much more ridiculous than we could ever do on our own. I pray that as we get into your word today, that you would just open up our eyes and allow us to be um, inspired to come alongside the great co-mission that you put us on. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. You can be seated. This... Uh, this story, this miracle, it's like in the Gospels, as we, we find it in Mark, we find it in Matthew, we find it in John. I mean, different, different caveats and, and changes to it. The reality is, is that uh, at the end of the day, 5,000 people, uh, men, ex excluding women and children, were fed with five loaves of fish and two bread, uh, or five, five loaves of bread and two fish, excuse me. Um, and right before all of this happens that we started reading in verse 13. It says in verse 13, when Jesus heard what had happened. So let me just give you a little bit of background. This is what happened. Um, Jesus had just heard the news that his cousin, John the Baptist, the, the, the man who introduced Jesus as the Messiah, the one who baptized Jesus, the one who prepared the way for Jesus, has been beheaded. Um, He's died. And there's a whole lot of feeling, I'm sure, in the midst of that. And it says this, when Jesus heard what had happened, his response was he withdrew by boat privately to a solitary place. Now, it sounds like he went all by himself. 
the way we read it here. It's like, okay, he withdrew by boat privately to a solid, solitary place. But we find out in Mark's gospel that um, Jesus didn't actually go just all by himself. He took his closest friends with him to withdraw, to, to get away. And um, it's important to realize this, that like as we look at the, the habits and the routines of Jesus in, in his earthly ministry, withdrawal doesn't mean isolation. Um, it's important for us to get this because I think especially in our current kind of like um, ideology and, um, and psychology will we'll tell you, well, you just need more me time, right? I just need to get, a, get away, get alone, be all by myself. Um, but what we find is Jesus did that at times, but, but many times getting away for Jesus meant getting alone with his closest friends. This is, this is really significant because this was a common practice for Jesus. I mean, it was a habit. It was, a, it was honestly a self-discipline for him. It was a rhythm of Jesus' life. If you look through the Gospels, you'll see time and time again when things got busy, when the crowd got to be too demanding, too big, when, the, when all of his responsibilities began to just ramp up, Jesus would always find an off-ramp, a rest stop, a rest area. He would pull over and just get away from the crowd for a little bit. And it would say that, it says here that he, he got away to lonely places. He would get away from the crowd, essentially, is what that means. And sometimes he would go up on a mountainside to pray. Uh, he found refuge at the Garden of Gethsemane with a few of his closest friends uh, just hours before he was to be uh, tortured and then killed. I mean, if we learn what it looks like to live life on mission, then sometimes you need to withdraw so that you don't drop out. And, and, and I think this is a practice, this is a habit, this is a routine that we see in the life of Jesus that we need to take note of, especially in a day and age where we watch pastors and leaders falling into things that they shouldn't be falling into. Could it be that the reason is they've failed to withdraw before they dropped out? Like withdrawing doesn't mean quitting. It doesn't mean taking a leave of absence. It doesn't mean calling up Melissa and saying, hey, Missy, I can't, I can't help out with the kids' ministry anymore because Pastor Justin said I can't now. Um, no, it means, it means literally making a, an intentional time to get alone with your heavenly father. Maybe that means I'm going to get up early to get alone with God because my family is crazy. I'm going, to get, I'm going to stay up late after the kids go to bed to get alone. I'm going to take a day on just, just, to be, just to get alone with my Heavenly Father, to get refocused on why I do what I do. Sometimes we forget that, don't we? In the midst of doing all of the things that are good things and even things that are like godly things, we, we, in the midst of all the demands and things that come up on us, we forget to really recognize why we do what we do so that we don't drop out of that which God has called us to do. And look, sometimes that looks like taking a Sabbath. Sometimes that looks like pausing so that you don't have to stop. So many times we run, 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 and then I have to hit stop and, and, and just, I'm out. The wheels came off the bus. Rather than taking pauses as we go to get refilled, and as a Christian, I want to say this, if you're a Christian in here, if you are not disciplining yourself to get filled up, eventually you will have nothing to pour out. And we watch this play out time and time again. Burnout has less to do with, oh my gosh, I just had too many things going on. Jesus had too many things going on, but he always spent time to get filled up with his father so that he had something to pour out. And it's a slippery slope to burnout when we feel like we're too busy to get filled if you're too busy to get filled, you have to make time, specific time, create that discipline in your life. If it was important to Jesus, if he needed this, and he's the God incarnate, the son of God, how much more important should it be for you and for I to, to get alone, to get refocused on why we do what we do on a regular basis so that we can withdraw before we drop out? Amen. One of the things that we talk about here as a church family, one of our core values, is that we create space for God to fill. If there is no space for God to fill because it's all booked up, you have literally no time. I just want to say this, and I mean this in the most amount of love as your pastor. It is your responsibility to create time, to create margin, 
to make sure that you are getting filled up so that you have something to pour out. I want to remind you, when God says, honor the Sabbath, take a rest, it wasn't a suggestion. It's one of the 10, the big ones. It's a commandment. Honor the Sabbath. And it's for your good. So it's important for us to realize it's part of, you know, honoring the Sabbath is part of our responsibility to do that which what God calls us to do, to pause so that we don't drop out of that which he's called us to do. So honor the Sabbath. Make space for God to fill. It's not a suggestion. It's a commandment. Because sometimes we think like, oh, I know the way for me not to drop out is to just not drop out. The way for me not to drop out is just to just keep going, just keep moving, just keep working longer hours. Don't let up. Don't let them see you cry. Just keep moving. But if we follow the leading of Jesus, we realize that the way to not give up is to actually withdraw so that you don't drop out. So key. So key for each and every single, I don't care where you are. If you're, if you're a mom with, with young kids that are just so demanding of your time, or, or, or you're a retiree and you're kind of in a new phase of your life, we can all allow the demands of life to overtake our time of getting filled up with the Lord and find ourselves getting burned out because we haven't been filled up. So I would encourage you to make time uh, to create space for God to fill. So Jesus and his disciples, let's move on, he, they get on the boat and they're heading somewhere where the crowds are not. Uh, we don't know exactly where they were headed. It was like the desert, the wilderness. It was an uninhabited place. They were going to a place just to vacate, right? To get, to go on a little bit of a vacation away from all the demands of the crowd. It had been a heavy lift. They just found out that John the Baptist was killed. This is not, not, not a great day. It says, verse 13, hearing of this, the crowds followed him on foot from the towns. I kind of feel like being Jesus must have felt like every mom with small kids. Like, if you're a mom, if you had small kids, or if you're in the throes of having uh, little, little humans around you all the time, um, you would understand this. Um, I don't know why. I, I, I kind of dodged the bullet. Maybe dads, I don't know. It's, it seems like a, a mom thing that, that the moms have to go through. But you would think, as a mom with a small kid, that like, um, going to the bathroom would be a private time, right? You'd think like, you know what? I, the kids are hanging on me. They're like on me all the time. They're always needing me all the time. But if I, I could surely get three minutes in the bathroom with a locked door without a child, right? Like that would be a normal expectation, you would think. Um, you'd think that that would be, that would just be, that would be fine. Unless you have small children and then you're like, yeah, that doesn't, that doesn't happen. Like you can lock the door and it really doesn't matter. Like, it's like they know, and they will literally put their heads down on the ground with a little crack of the door open, and they're like, Mommy, Mom, 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 what are you doing down there? Ma, I can, I can see your feet, Mommy. <laughs> you know, like, literally, and you're, the mom's just like, would you just please let me poop in peace, right? <laughs> just give me, just give me three minutes, kid. Like, I, I am not kidding. I am, I'm literally going crazy right now. I can't even go to the bathroom for three minutes without a little human trying to like break in. Like, you don't want to be in here now. I don't even want to be in here, right? This is crazy, right? It's so true. It's, it is very true. And, and as I look at this, I, I think of Jesus. It must have been like this for Jesus. Like the crowds... Um, hear that Jesus is like, I, you know what? We're going to get some alone time. We're going to just get away. And the crowds are like, great. I'll keep you great company, right? Like we're coming too. And so they're like, I almost imagine this, that they're like on a boat rowing on the, sh and, and there's like all these people running on the shoreline, like, hey, Jesus, where are you going? And he's like, I'm going over here. And they're like, me too. <laughs> and they're, they're just literally following Jesus wherever he goes. Now, now, this, this might be something that Jesus could handle. Well, because he's like Jesus, right? He's like Jesus. So, of course, he has patience and all this stuff with humanity. But I just think, like, how annoyed the disciples must have been as they're like, you have got to be kidding me. Jesus, tell them to leave. Some vacation this is. You said, we, we got to get away from these people, and I imagine them like rowing away from the crowd 
watching the crowd run after them. And not only that, essentially it seems that the crowd actually beats them to their vacation spot ahead of them, which is, oh my, think about how maddening that would be. You're just trying to get away from all the people at your workplace, and then all of a sudden you, you, you land and, and they're all waiting there. Surprise! And you're like, ah! You know, you're freaking out. Like, I just needed to get away from you people, right? And they're waiting there. Verse 14, it says this, when Jesus landed and saw a large crowd, he had compassion on them and healed their sick. So even though Jesus is hurting him, he just found out that his cousin has been beheaded. Even though he's grieving, even, even though he's just needing to get some rest, some respite to just withdraw, the Bible says that he had compassion on them. And the word used in Greek is almost like that the compassion overwhelmed him. Like Jesus simply cannot help himself but help people who are in need. And what his followers would have seen as an interruption, he saw as an opportunity, even though he was tired. And he ministers, catch this, guys, he ministers to this crowd that he's trying to avoid all day long. He doesn't just like get off the boat and he's like, yeah, he's like throwing a little bit of holy water there. Gotcha, gotcha, gotcha. And he just goes on. They're going into their closed, you know, community, close the gate and be like, peace out, everybody. No, he ministers all day long. Honestly, if it were me, if I were Jesus, or if I was just like a spokesperson for Jesus, you know, I would literally be yelling. I'd be like, get out of here. Leave us alone, you vultures. Like, Give us, like, our friend just died. Like, give us, give us a, little, a little bit of quiet time for one stinking day. But that's just me. And Jesus isn't like that. Jesus, I think he's teaching his followers something here. And this is so important when it comes to the rhythms of living on mission is that we may be withdrawing, but that does not mean that we're dropping out. And this is the balance. As we look at the life of Jesus, he was never willing just to kick people out and say, get out of here. And it's this reality that the Great Commission is never dependent on my mood. <laughs> he never puts it on the shelf. It's like, oh, you're having a bad day? Oh, you're going through something? Okay, well, don't worry about it. We'll just, we won't worry about that right now. Like, um, living on mission as we, if we watch the life of Jesus, it's, is noticing the need around you and being moved beyond your own personal pain. And this is the hard part, and this is the part, even as a pastor, like that sometimes we minister in the midst of our pain. And I would even say that sometimes we find a deeper level of God's compassion when we find ourselves in pain. Realizing and seeing the pain of humanity, realizing and seeing, I'd really like a break, I'd really like to get away, and yet I can't say no to the dying, crying humanity that is right in front of me. I think it's that Jesus is reminding them that, like, you can't compartmentalize the Great Commission. You can't say, oh, that's just a Sunday morning. That's just, are you on schedule today for the Great Commission? Oh, it's just a service. It's a, it's a role. It's a position. It's a task. That, that's only for the, the professionals. Like, following Jesus is not a part-time job. And, and living on mission is not something that you get to turn on and off like a light switch and say, I'm off duty. I'm sorry. I'd love to pray for you, but time's a ticking. And Jesus is always reminding us that, that many times when we are waiting to follow Jesus until our, our pain is healed, we could be waiting a long time because following Jesus oftentimes means that your pain might be the platform to help other people that are in pain. Sometimes God uses the, the things and the, the circumstances in your own life to be able to to give hope and to minister to others that are going through the same thing. Like sometimes it's our, when our compassion is actually the strongest, that our love is the greatest. Ah. And so Jesus and his disciples are, 
They're probably emotional. They're probably tired physically. Um, this little vacation has not turned out like the brochure said it would. Um, Jesus is ministering all day long. And if you don't believe me, look at verse 15. It says this, as evening approached, <laughs> it's a long day, the disciples came to him and said, this is a remote place. In other words, we're in the middle of nowhere, and it's already getting late. Send the crowds away so that they can go to the villages and buy themselves some food. Now, I, I want to I make it pretty clear. Um, you, you know that they weren't actually going around like taking a poll of like, hey, I'm just trying to get some information for Jesus. He's concerned you might be hungry. There's like, so how hungry are you? Like, not hungry, I could eat, or starving. Which one is it? Like, you know what I mean? I'm just trying to, we're taking a straw poll here, just trying to figure out, like, we have 15,000 people here. We're just taking a Wendy's order, just wondering if this is, uh, you in? Are you in? Like, that is not what's happening here. No, what's happening here is this. This reality that we all know well is that when I'm hungry, I think everyone must be hungry. And when I'm hungry and it's like six o'clock and, and we're not eating till seven, oh my gosh, what is wrong with humanity, right? Everyone must be starving right now. I don't understand why we're not eating right now because I'm hungry. Everyone must be. I think that the, the disciples are wanting to eat. I think they're hungry. I think they're probably hangry and they want to take a break. And they're just biding their time, waiting for Jesus to finish up, healing and praying for all of these people that they wish they wouldn't be around. And they're in the middle of nowhere. The Bible says that there is about 5,000 men, not including women and children. This means, if, if, if you, I'm going to kind of throw out some numbers here. This means that that crowd was probably... 15,000 to 20,000 people strong, which makes it even more outlandish. There's like 5,000 men, not including women and children. So let's just say conservatively there are 15,000 people in this crowd, and no one had a plan for dinner. DoorDash wasn't around then. Uber Eats didn't exist. They're, they're like, I, we're, they're in the middle of nowhere. I mean, they're just trying to find anything that moves, thinking maybe we'll eat that thing, right? Like, they're hungry. And I love how Jesus responds to them. Verse 16, Jesus says to them, no, 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 no. They don't need to go away. You give them something to eat. <laughs> I'm sorry? Like, if it were me, I, let's say I was one of the, 12 disciples, I would probably laugh, almost like, I'd probably laugh out loud. Like, what, what are you even talking about? Have you seen this crowd, Jesus? Like, there are like 15,000 people here. Are you crazy? And what's interesting is this. Jesus always seems to call us to help meet the needs of, of people. He's essentially saying to them, you feed them. But I don't I don't have anything. You feed them. Or he says, he says, he says to you, you adopt a child. Well, I just, I'm just passionate about, about abortion. You foster a kid. Well, <laughs> will you give that? Well, I was, I'd rather give other people's money. I, I'm sure you would, but you give it. Like, Jesus is always coming and saying like, hey, um, that little that you have, I'm asking you to give it. But that's kind of what your job, isn't it, Jesus? I just kind of follow along and be like, hey, hey, I'm with him. Like, that's kind of, that's what we do, right? Like, I, I'm the guy with the guy. And he's like, no, 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 no. That's the great co-mission. You give the little you have, and then I get to do something amazing with it. Yes. You feed them. You give them something to eat. This is 15,000 people. I know. But I think that Jesus is teaching them that part of living on mission is, first and foremost, church, simply recognizing what you hold in your hand. Can I remind you that Jesus loves bringing you into the blessing? He is always calling you to join him in the great commission. And part of it is just realizing what you're holding onto in your hand. It doesn't have to be a lot. It can just, like, literally, you think of Moses, right? The Lord says to Moses, what do you have in your hand? And he's like, this? It's a stick. 
great. And then he puts his super on Moses' natural. And all of a sudden now, this is the stick that opens up the Red Sea. This is the stick that strikes the rock. This, I mean, all of a sudden now, God takes a stick, that which Moses had in his hand, and does something absolutely amazing with it. And so many miracles is God multiplying that which you have in your hand. And he says, what is it that you're... Like, if you've got zero, zero t- multiplied by anything is always going to be zero. But you're like, well, I have this slice of bread. And he's like, awesome, give that to me. Now I have something to multiply. Now I have something to, to work with. It's kind of like, we talk about like tithing, right? We talk about like <clears throat> your tithe, your giving is just a sum of money that you could spend on a whole bunch of other things. In fact, you're like, yeah, sometimes it's really hard because I've got these other things that I need to pay for, that I want to buy, that I want to do. But let me just remind you, when you invest into God's kingdom, he does more with it than you could ever purchase on your own because he loves multiplication. And he doesn't ask you to bring, oh my gosh, I just need you to give a million dollars. And you're like, I don't have a million dollars. Whew, that's awesome. No, he's like, here's your dollar. Do you have a dollar? Oh, because a dollar in his hands is so much greater. He multiplies it than a dollar in mine. And so many times we can get so focused on what we don't have. Well, I don't have this. I'm not enough. I don't have enough. All these things. And I think that sometimes walking in God's provision is recognizing what you do have. What is it that you hold in your hand? But it's not enough. And God's like, I know. He's under no illusion that you don't hold everything at your fingertips. He's the one who holds the world in his hands. He's just saying, what do you have in yours? I'd love you to be a part of this great co-mission. He goes on in verse 17. He says, they, they answer his question. They're like, well, we have here only five loaves of bread and two fish, they answered. I realize that they, there is no miracle-making faith here in this statement. They're just literally, nobody's expecting that they're going to feed 15,000 people with these five loaves of bread and, and two fish. I love how they know exactly how much food that they have. Because how many of you know when you're hungry, you be counting the French fries in the bottom of the bag, right? When you're hungry, man, you're like, ah, hold on, hold on. I mean, you just find the grease spot. And you're, you know, I mean, you're just trying to get everything because you're hungry. They know exactly how much food that they have. They're under no illusion. They're like, I don't know, maybe a few, a few loaves of bread. They're like, no, we have five loaves of bread and two fish. And it's not enough, right? I mean, they're literally, there's no faith here. They're like, oh, there should be enough for you to feed all of these people. They're like, and this is all we have. They say literally, this is only what we have. They're counting everything. They're counting everything. John's gospel tells us that in this story, and I may be going on a limb here, but I kind of read it in that they all, they, they had all but probably beat up a little kid to get this lunch. Because this, when they say, oh, we only have five loaves of bread and two fish, um, John's gospel tells us that it was a little boy that had it. So I don't know if they're like, (laughs) yeah, we got like five loaves of bread and two fish. (laughs) Right, and they're just kicking this kid out. Here's what I love about this. It it absolutely um, blows my mind is that God uses a kid who's not even counted to give the food. It's not even counted. 5,000 people excluding women and children. And this is the kid who gives his lunch and feeds all these people. Jesus says to them, bring them here to me. And he said, "Um, we don't exactly know what happens after this. It it, it doesn't give us quotes in the red of, of how it all worked out. It gets really kind of fuzzy here. And I think that's probably true because I don't think anyone really understands how this miracle happened, but essentially Jesus turns and yells to the the crowd of 15,000 people and says to them, hey, everybody, excuse me, pardon me, I'll wait, I'll wait, wait, let me teach your voice. Um, Everyone needs to sit down on the grass. My followers are going to be feeding you. To which if I was a follower, I'd be like, "Did did you just hear what he just said? Like, are you, 
What is wrong with him? Who gave him his talking points? You know, they're like uh, trying to cover up his mouth. Be like, oh, Jesus, he's such a kidder. Everybody, Jesus Christ, uh, get out of here. Right? I mean, they're literally like, what in the world is going on right now? Jesus, why would you say something like that? We just told you what we have. You told everyone to sit down and that we're, we have an angry, hangry crowd waiting for us to feed them and we don't have food for them. See, we all have the benefit of knowing how the story ends, but these poor dudes were like confused and hangry and tired, just like you and I. And they are unable to see God's provision because all they see is overwhelming problem. And isn't that how life is? So hard to sometimes see God's provision. How's he going to work this out? How's he going to, what's he going to do here? I have no clue how he's going to be able to even do this. It's impossible. And it's so hard to see his provision when all you see is an overwhelming problem. And so these disciples, I, if, if it were me, I'd be like calculating portion sizes, right? I'd be like, okay, all right, oh, come here, guys, come on, come on, we got 15,000. Okay, cool, cool, cool. And they're like, okay, everyone gets this amount of bread and then... Um, a fish scale. So here you go. Excuse me, sir. Open your mouth. Oh, there you go. Let's hope God does a miracle in your mouth. Okay, cool. I mean, like, literally, they're trying to, they're trying to figure out how in the world are we going to do this? God, you know, Jesus just said we're going to feed everybody. We have, no, we, have, we have no food to feed them. They're seeing if there's any French fries left in the bottom of the bag. And we got nothing to offer to feed these 15,000 people. And Jesus is announcing that he's going to feed them with what you have to offer. With, 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 with what we have to offer? Uh, if, that, if that's how this thing's working, it's not, it's not going to go anywhere. And see, there are so many times when God will give you a vision for something that is larger than you can envision. Because all we look at is the things that we have in our hand, and he's like, you're going to feed 15,000 people. And we're like, I don't think so. I don't... <laughs> I don't, that's not going to happen. And he's giving you a vision that's larger than you can envision. It's almost like, I wonder, if Jesus let them sit down and count and calculate and portion size the impossibility so that they finally came honestly, rationally, logically to the realization we don't have enough. To which Jesus maybe looked at them and said, I know. I'm fully aware. Bring it to me. Let's do something with it. Verse 21, it says, the number of those who ate was about 5,000 men besides women and children. Came from a little boy. I absolutely love the fact that God uses people who other people don't even count. That he uses a little boy who's not even counted in the men. He feeds 5,000 men, excluding women and children, through a child. And I want to encourage some of you in here, because this is an awesome real reality. I, I love this portion, that they didn't even count this kid, and he's the one who provided the food, right? And you may be thinking to yourself, like, I don't have anything to give. I don't have what it takes. Like, I don't have enough. God, like, I, I don't even know what I'm supposed to do, but can I remind you of something, that God likes the unlikely. He loves the overlooked. And when you're living on mission, Jesus never takes a look at what you do have and minimizes what you have to offer. He multiplies it. That's the beauty of it. He doesn't minimize it. He doesn't say, oh, that's all you have? Oh, that's only? No, we say that. We say, oh, I only have this. I don't have anything to, I, I only have this. And he's like, perfect, that's just enough. All I needed was something. Because that's, that's how I multiply things. Bring it to me. Give it to me. And so be careful. Be careful when, you, when you're tempted to count someone out, especially when that person is you. Especially when that person is you. And he continues in verse 19, he says, taking the five loaves and two fish. This is when it gets cray-cray. He's looking up to heaven, and he gives thanks 
And, and then he broke the loaves. I love that Jesus gives thanks for that which is not enough, and then God somehow multiplies it into more than enough. He's literally like, thank you, this is not enough. <laughs> and God's like, no problem, I'll make it more than enough. What in the world? This is the first kind of like miracle. If even even as, as, as Jesus looks up and gives thanks to the Father for that which is not enough, he's like, it's not everything that I need, but it, I thank you for what I have. And I wonder, I wonder if, if, think about this, if our surrender, if our thankfulness for what we do have opens up the opportunity for God to bring provision for what we don't have. Let me say that one more time. I wonder if our thankfulness for what we do have opens up opportunity for God to bring provision for what we don't have. Are you being thankful for what you do have or are you waiting and expecting and complaining and griping for that which you don't have? So Jesus gives thanks and he breaks the five loaves and then it says that he gave them to his disciples and the disciples gave them to the people. Now, again, we know how the story ends. But I want you to think what it must have been like to be one of these 12 guys staring at a crowd of 15,000 people with your small half loaf of bread from Jesus. And he's like, okay, uh, here you go, make it last. What? This is laughable. This, this, this is supposed to do that? I, I have no idea how this is going to work. They must have thought, like, this is not enough. My portion seems ridiculous. What's interesting to me is that, especially when it comes to faith, and all across this place, you know, we, we grow from faith to faith, that God, we've seen, different people have seen God move in different ways. You have, different, you have a faith that's stronger for me in other areas, and I may have a strength, that, uh, strength uh, for a faith that's stronger in, 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 in a different area than you. What's interesting to me is that what one person considers radical is another person's normal. So I, I've, I've seen like legs grow. I've seen backs healed. And so if, I, if I'm going to pray for somebody, I'm thinking, I've seen it before. God will do it. And you're looking at me like, that's radical. I've never seen that before. That's absolutely radical. But the reality is, is what I consider radical is just a little bit more past normal. So I look to somebody else. I'm like, you're radical, which in reality is you're just a couple steps past my normal. And these guys, these same disciples that are standing there holding onto their half loaf of bread, they have watched Jesus heal blind eyes, open up deaf ears, watch the lame walk, cast out demons, even raise the dead. They've seen limbs grow. These same disciples have been commissioned, in fact, given authority to go out two by two to do the things that Jesus has done, and they did it. And I, I, I would consider these guys to be radicals, and yet this miracle was even too radical for the radicals. That's why, I, that's why I absolutely love this miracle because it is absolutely crazy. Absolutely crazy. But sometimes living on mission means I am just called to do the thing that Jesus has called me to do, not knowing what he's going to do with my simple act of obedience. You catch that? Many times, church, our job is to take this half loaf of bread that he's given to us and give it away and have no clue how in the world we, I guess it's we, we can say it's we, right, Jesus, can feed 15,000 people with the thing that you just gave me to give away. Many times we have no idea what our simple act of obedience all of a sudden launches into play and makes a way where God could, where there, where there absolutely was no way before. I think about how hard it must have been for them to just give away their portion, wondering how's God going to provide. And they just start handing it out. Imagine this. And the miracle happens in their hands. They break it, and it just keeps, what in the world? As they're giving it away. The miracle happens as they give away that which Jesus has given to them. The blessing does not happen with what they hold onto their into their hands, the blessing happened with what passed through their hands. This is so key. 
Many times we want to define blessing as though I'm blessed to be hashtag blessed. But God creates us to be blessed to be a blessing. And the blessing actually happens not in what we hold on to. The blessing happens in what passes through our hands. And as long as we're trying to measure blessing by what we hold on to, we will miscalculate the economy of heaven. Church, I want you to get this because the kingdom of God, fullness is not measured by what you contain. Fullness is measured by what overflows through you. And as long as we're trying to have a deficit mindset, thinking like, oh, I just need to hold on to things and that makes, makes me blessed, you will never allow the things that God gives you to flow through you to others. And you always think that you are blessed to be hashtag blessed rather than blessed to be a blessing. And Jesus teaches something very important to his followers, and it's this, when, when you offer what you hold in your hand, God can provide more than you can hold. It doesn't make any sense. Unless you've witnessed it yourself. I think of like, even for me, the the trust of of tithing, of giving for me, like personally. When when you choose to to trust trust in the Lord and like, okay, I'm, I'm taking my tithe and I'm, I'm giving that over to the Lord. Like you, you realize, if you've, if you've trusted him with this, you realize how precisely absurd the economy of heaven is. It doesn't make a lick of sense because in all other areas, you think, I give and that means less for me. And I'm sure this is the exact same thing that was going on in the, the minds of the disciples. Wait, I have a half loaf of bread. If I give it away, that's less for me. No, it's not. There's more. There's, what in the world? I feel like that's what happens to me every week when I tithe. I'm like, okay, all right, good. Where would that come from? Okay, I'm gonna, what in the world? You know, you're literally, you find yourself, like I'm to the point where I, can, I cannot afford not to tithe. And, and I mean this because I think I'm better off with recognizing God as my provider than living under the illusion that I am. I'm coming to that place of like, like, as long as I'm thinking like, oh man, I got to earn, I got to garner, I got to save, I got to hold, I got I to contain, I find I have less and I never have enough. And as I give, as I choose to trust God, it literally, I, the economy of heaven is absolutely precisely absurd and makes no sense. When we choose to, to realize that he alone is our provider, then all of a sudden things change. I used to think that this feeding of the 5,000 thing was all a bunch of hundred, hungry crowd of people. And it was, that's what it was about. And it is to a degree. They're hungry. They needed food. Jesus was meeting a need. Um, but the more I look at it, the more I realize that Jesus was teaching his followers so many things. Like what, what if God is reminding us, you will never actually have enough. Quit waiting for it. Someone in here needs to hear that. You're holding up for this, wow, one day, if I can get this, if I get that, if I get more, if I get this raise, if I get this thing, if this, if this windfall, if this happens, if the... <laughs> I think it's just really, the longer I live, the more I realize that, like, you will never have enough. Quit waiting for it. Quit waiting for it. Because, because, Christian, if you're continually looking for what you do have to be the determiner of what God wants to do, then you will always be caught up short. Well, I'm just waiting. I'll, I'll, I'll do this. I'll give when. When never seems to come. <laughs> because fullness is not measured by what you contain. Fullness is measured by what overflows. Yeah. The miracle is not what you have to offer, church. The miracle happens when, when what you have is given to God. And it makes no sense. And it does to those who have trusted him. Why don't you stand with me? It's that sobering reality of like, God, there's so many gifts and talents and 
passions, aptitudes, and things that, that, that are all in the hearts of, of God's people. And I feel so often we're waiting till, well, I'm just waiting until I finish up my degree. I'm waiting until I get this job. I'm waiting until this career shift. I'm waiting until I have enough or this or whatever. And God's saying, like, just what do you have in your hand? What do you have in your hand? He says this. I love verse 20. It says, they all ate and were satisfied. And the disciples picked up 12 basketfuls of broken pieces that were left over. I don't know if you ever thought about this before. Where did the 12 baskets come from? <laughs> like, is there a miracle that we didn't realize that like Jesus was like multiplying baskets on the fly as well? Like it wasn't just loaves and fishes. It was like baskets too. That all of a sudden they got these baskets. Nobody planned for lunch, but they all got baskets. You know, everyone's walking home with these baskets. I wonder if these baskets still exist. They're in like museums now. This is a basket that was made out of thin air, right? Nobody wove this thing. This is heavenly woven, right? This reality that like God starts to just provide in amazing ways. And then there's 12. It says 12 basketfuls left over. Why 12? What's significant of 12? There's 12 disciples. I think God's communicating. Hey, guys, um, you didn't have enough, um, but I made more than enough to not only feed 15,000 people, and if there were 5,000 more, we would have fed them too. And not only that, there are leftovers to provide for you 12 disciples as well. There's enough left over. I think many times as we're being used by God or we're choosing to say, okay, God, I'm going to trust you with this. I'm going to take a step of faith. I'm going to release this. I'm going to use this thing that you've given me. I'm going to use these, these talents, these giftings. I'm going to use them for your glory. I'm, going to, I'm choosing to trust you that you're going to do something greater than I could ever do if I just held on to it myself. I think many times we have these thoughts of like, Lord, you're going to be blessing other people through me, but what about me? Who's looking out for me? What about mine? What about mine? And I love the fact that God is looking out for you. He's not just looking out for the crowd, the 15,000 hungry people. He's looking out for the people that are serving, the people that are giving, the people that are trusting, the people that he's living on mission with. The beautiful thing is that Jesus never sought out people who were rich and famous and had all kinds of things to offer. He would see, search out people like fishermen and tax collectors and sinners on purpose prostitutes and rebels and rejects and those who have been thrown away, the outcasts, the poor, the blind, the sick. And he's like, hey, you guys, come follow me. You look great. Yeah, come on. And he says to them, give me what you have. To which every single one of them would look at their hands and say, I, <laughs> you got nothing to offer you, Jesus. We're not rich and famous. I have no connections. I got nothing. I have need. That's what I have. Do you want me to give you my need? I have nothing to give. And I love the fact that, that Jesus says, just give me whatever you have in your hand. A stick? Yeah. If you give it to me, I'll work a miracle with it. That Jesus only ever asks us to give what we have in our hand today. This is so key, church. Do you realize that Jesus never asks you to give what you wish you had? You realize that Jesus never asked you to give what you might have someday. He never asked you to give what, what you could have. He never asked you to give what other people have. That would be nice, wouldn't it? <laughs> I'd love to give away your money, right? I mean, like, he, he asked you to give what you have in your hand today, and he simply asks you to give that. But we only have five loaves and two fish. It's not enough. And I think Jesus is longing for us to take our only and give it to him. But it's not enough. He's like, I, I'm well aware. I'm well aware. I see the need. I just love it when my people come alongside me in the great commission and choose to give that which they hold in their hand to see me do a miracle, do far greater than they could ever do on their own. It's the beauty of the body of Christ living on mission together. A bunch of ragtag group of people. Who would have thought that we'd be pouring into the nations? Who, who, I mean, the, the, a small church in the middle of the center of the universe, Biddeford, Maine, building churches and planting churches in India. I mean, all over. But when we 
take that which we have in our hand and we allow him to use it, he does far more than we could ever do on our own. Be the answer to the needs that we see around us. And God is fully aware that you need him to do it. If you can do it on your own, it's not big enough. I'll just tell you that. It's not God-sized. It's you-sized. He continually calls us to a, to a vision that is very hard to envision without him, the body of Christ. So Lord, I just pray as we enter into this worship song today, I pray that you would come bring vision alive in God's people. Lord, as we even just look at opportunities that are right in front of us, opportunities um, that, that are in our, in our families, opportunities to reach out into, uh, into the globe, reach out into, into Biddeford, Lord, I pray that you would just bring passions, bring aptitudes, bring talents, bring giftings, Lord Jesus. Bring that which we have in our hands and give it over to you and see you do something so amazing to feed 15,000 people for lunch. If you can do that, honestly, I feel like you can do anything. So lift up, take off the blinders off of our faith today, Jesus. Allow us to believe you for greater things than we're able to do on our own. Have you do what only you can do. In Jesus' name, let's worship him together.